Hello and welcome to the 8th talk in a series of talks on the documents of the Second Vatican Council given for the Year of Faith. This talk is given by Father Andrew Warman. Father Andrew is Diocese of Vocations Director for the Diocese of Lancaster and Assistant Priest at St Bernadette's Bispa. He's talking about Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy and the Decree on the Ministry and Life of Priests. This talk was held at St Wilfrid's Parish Centre, Preston, on Thursday the 23rd of May 2013. This series is facilitated by the Metanoia Project. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me, thank you for, for coming. Um, I've been asked to talk about two of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the um, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, and uh, Presbyterorum Ordinis, which is always quite a difficult thing to say, uh, which is the document on the ministry and life of priests. Um, how, how many of you have been to most of these talks or other of these talks? Most of you. Okay. So you've got some sense of, of some of the other things that the council did. And most of us have a sense, I think, of things that the council said and did. Some of you, indeed, lived through the council and will remember some things that it did. I obviously didn't, so um, I'm conscious that I'm talking to people who have some direct experience of these things that I don't have. Sacrosanctum Concilia, I'm going to devote most of the time to this document on the liturgy because I think it's more immediately relevant to most of us, um, and in some ways it, it's more important as well, I think, in terms of what it did, what it, what it said. The, the title itself has nothing to do with the liturgy, but it, it was the first document that the council produced. And so the very first thing that it did in the first paragraph of that document is to set out what the aims of the council are. And it says that the, the, it lists four things in the first paragraph. The first one, to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful. Secondly, to adapt more closely to the need of our age those institutions which are subject to change. And therefore, by implication, there are some institutions in the life of the church which are not subject to change. To foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ. And finally, to strengthen whatever can help all mankind into the church's fold. So in other words, the four things were to strengthen faith and help us to live a Christian life. To adapt the church and its patterns to the present age, insofar as that was possible and a good thing to do to foster ecumenism, the unity of the followers of Christ, and also to, basically to evangelize, really, to draw people into the life of the church. Those were what the council set out to do. And because of that, it says, it sees a particularly important need to reform the liturgy, because it is, in some ways, the most visible part of the church. It was important that the liturgy particularly matched up to these four things and, and did what, what it was hoping to, what the council was hoping to do. The word liturgy, it comes from two Greek words. It's important, uh, in a sense, to spell this out when we're talking about what the liturgy is and what it means, which is obviously the, the subject of the document. And those words are public work. That's what it means. So by its nature, the liturgy is its public, it's communal, it's something which is also in the service of the people. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who said that when he was in seminary, the, the liturgy prof told them, that um, the street cleaners in Athens, he said, not that they ever had any, street cleaners in Athens would have been doing the liturgia, the, the liturgy, the public work, the public service in a sense, by sweeping the, the clean. It's a Greek word, that's why I used Athens. The point is, it's a public thing, it's a communal thing, it's not a private thing, and it's a public service in a sense, service for the people. When we talk about the liturgy, also I just want to put some barriers on and explain what the church means by that, because that's important as well. Liturgy basically means the mass, the sacraments, the liturgy of the hours, and funerals. That's basically, the liturgy of the hours is, is the breviary, it's the, the morning prayer, evening prayer of the church, and so on. It doesn't mean things like our private prayer. It doesn't mean services that we create ourselves. It doesn't mean devotions like the rosary or the stations of the cross, those sorts of things. They're not liturgy. The liturgy is the mass, the sacraments, the office, the liturgy of the hours, and funerals. So that's just so that we know what we're, what we're talking about. What I propose to do is just to talk a little bit, in one sense, just to go through what the document says and to provide some kind of commentary on it, because I think everybody's conscious that this document did so much to renew the life of the church and brought about so much change, which many people absolutely rejoiced in and other people were quite uneasy about. It was very controversial. While everybody seems to have an opinion about it, I wonder how many people actually read it. How many of you actually have read it? Any of you? Yeah, some of you have. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, that's four. 
No, no, this is this is everything that the council said oh, and yeah. more. Um, it's it actually it's not too long. I mean, it's in this book just to give you some idea. It's a, yeah, it's about thirty pages. So it you know it wouldn't take an age to read, um, but you do need some kind of keys. I think some some way of getting into it and, and uh, you know because it's it, you know unless you understand a bit of the context and so on, it can be quite hard sometimes to get hold of what it's trying to say. So the first chapter of the document. Is basically entitles itself some general principles for the restoration and promotion of the liturgy. This is what it's about restoring and promoting the church's liturgy. And the first part begins by kind of goes through some of the background really. It talks about the Old Testament as being prelude to the work of Christ, building up to the work of our Lord coming to earth. And what is central in the life of Christ, which is also central in the liturgy, is the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what is at the heart of the liturgy always. Um, so the, the document makes that point right from the start. It also talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which of course we celebrated last Sunday, and how the Holy Spirit also therefore you know, is active now in the, in the church's life, in its liturgy, and it talks about the gift of the sacraments. It talks about Christ being present in the liturgy, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And it talks about how the liturgy, what we experience on earth, what we do now in the liturgy, is actually a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy. So when you look at what the Bible says about heaven, often it talks about it being a kind of liturgical thing. You know, So the book of Revelation, which describes the scene in heaven, has angels singing the praises of God. It has them singing holy, holy, holy. Isaiah as well, holy, holy, holy Lord. That's where our words come from. Many of the words we use in the liturgy are taken from biblical images of heaven. Um, so it talks about those things. Revelation talks about incense being burnt in the presence of God and so on. So some of the things that we're used to are actually straight out of the Bible. The, the Bible says this is what heaven looks like, people's visions of heaven, and we use them, the words and some of the images as well. So it makes a, a reference to that as well. It says that the liturgy is not the entirety of the church's work. So obviously the church does lots of other things. It teaches, it evangelizes, it does charitable works, it does all sorts of things. So it's not the entirety of the church's work. But it is, and it's a good phrase to remember, the source and the summit of the church's life. So, in other words, everything that the church does springs from the liturgy and in some way leads towards it. So, we're inspired to go out and tell others about Christ because we meet him in the liturgy. We are inspired to do good works of charity because we meet Christ in the liturgy and he chose us. This is the way we ought to live and so on. But also that leads us back to the liturgy where we are gathered once again and where we are renewed and where, particularly, think about it, it's very obvious, at Mass, we are sent out to do those. When we're told, go forth, it's not just like, off you go now, get back to your homes, we're finished. It's go forth and do something. You know, you're being sent out with a mission. Um, that's, the, that's the purpose. Of it. So the source and the summit of the church's life. The, the document goes on then to make the point that in order for it to produce its full effect, we have to approach it with the right dispositions. Um, in other words, if we come to the liturgy without knowing what we're doing or in the wrong frame of mind or in a state of sin or whatever, actually it doesn't have the full impact that it can have. So that's important as well. And I think that's an important thing that the Council had in its mind throughout because as we'll see, one of the key things is that all of us should be invited to, to understand more what goes on in the liturgy. That's one of the Council's really important points. And then it does go on to speak a little bit about things outside of the liturgy, about private prayer and devotions and so on. So I just want to return now to this, this thing of the liturgy being a public work. It's a public work not so much as in a work of the people, I think, but it's a work of God for the people. And that's an important point because we sometimes think the liturgy is what we do for God. You know, we make the effort to go to Mass. We build these beautiful churches and we put on these beautiful services and we sing our hearts out and so on. And all of that's correct. But in the first place, the liturgy is not our work, it's God's work. It's what God does for us. So God calls us together. God speaks to us in the liturgy. God feeds us with the body and blood of Christ. God heals us in the sacraments of healing and so on. Okay, so it's what God gives to us. And our being there, we cooperate with that. But in the first place, it's the work of God, not the work of the people or the priest. And so the liturgy talks about, so the document talks about how the liturgy is an exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ. So it's Christ, actually, who is the priest there. There's a nice 
quotation from it. It says, he is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of his minister, the priest, and then it quotes a bit from the Council of Trent, the same now offering through the ministry of the priest who formerly offered himself on the cross. So it's about how Christ is the one who really offers the sacrifice of the Mass. But especially in the Eucharistic species, Holy Communion, by his power he, by his power, he is present in the sacraments, so that when anybody baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. So it's the Lord who is doing the work. He's doing human agents, but it is the Lord who is doing the work. And anything that doesn't um, help us to understand that, in some way, is not helpful. You know, we should be seeing Christ active in the liturgy, not ourselves. Because it is a reflection of the heavenly liturgy, as I was talking about there, because it's a reflection of of all those biblical, it draws from all those biblical images of heaven. Actually, the the origins of the liturgy are in heaven. It's not of human origin. It's given to us by God. And that's another very important point, that we understand that the liturgy is actually inspired by God. It's not something that we have created for to give praise to God. It's something that God has given to us. And you've already had the talk, haven't you, on, on Dei Verbum, I think, on the, so those of you who are at that, talk on the on the document on divine revelation talks about um, sacred scripture and sacred tr tradition being a single deposit of the word of god and what it's really saying is that the the tradition of the church by which it means things like liturgical texts the prayers that we use in the sacraments mass these things are also to be understood as being revealed by god to be part of the word of god revealed to us and that's really important because it actually makes a difference to how seriously we take those words as well when we listen to them or when we read them. The four presences of Christ in the Mass. Do you know these? In the Eucharist, thank you. That's good. And Scripture, in the congregation, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there, and in the priest. I always think God help us when I hear that. Point is, because it's Christ who acts in the liturgy and because the priest is doing a lot of those actions, that we talk about priests and those being as Alter Christus, another Christ, all of those things make me kind of tremble inside in some ways because you realize how badly you live up to it so often. The point is that at some level we understand that Christ is the one who really says those words, this is my body, this is my God. So in some way he's present in the, in the priest, um, in the Mass as well. Okay, just to kind of summarize those points. The, the liturgy originates in heaven. It's given to us by Christ himself, and Christ remains the principal actor. He is the one who is most active in the liturgy, and it is a public work. It's not a private thing that we hold on to ourselves. I want to just kind of move on a little bit now and talk about some of the things that led up to the council, and really to give some context to that. Now, as I say, some of you actually will remember a little bit, I'm not looking at anyone in particular, will remember a little bit the time before the council, uh, I imagine, or at least you know some of the, the old liturgy before the, before the liturgy was reformed. Um, but I want to rewind the clock much further, really, back to the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Trent, 1545 to 1563, so it's a long time ago. And that had instituted some fairly major reforms of the liturgy as well. And it was Trent happened in response to the Protestant Reformation, really, in Europe. It was the, the church trying to get its act together and respond to the challenges that were thrown up by, by that. But one of the things that it had done was it kind of done away with... At that time, there were lots of different rites of mass. So Trent said, well, unless it's over 200 years old, it's, it's banned now. You just, you know, so everybody starts using the same mass, really, the Tridentine mass, pretty much everywhere. You know, that Tridentine just means of the Council of Trent. So they started using that. But over time, that too kind of developed and some parts of it became more elaborate. Particularly in, in some of the larger churches, it followed some of the extravagances of royal courts around Europe and so on, and the music became more elaborate and kind of more operatic. It became very much more complicated. And these things, there's a kind of, in a way they're kind of organic, I suppose. They grow over time and occasionally they need pruning a little bit and chopping back. So people were beginning to understand that that was needed as well. People, I suppose you could say, it kind of became more and more the case that people attended Mass but participated less. So responses uh, at one time were answered really only by a server. People couldn't hear very much, and partly, I suppose, that's practical reasons. That if you've got some massive cathedral church somewhere and you have no microphones, you just there are no ways of making people hear things. It was, in a sense, the mass was going on. People may have attended, but were getting on with their own private prayers. They probably didn't receive Holy Communion very frequently, and Latin, which at one time was a widely understood language, became less and less understood. 
So people were becoming detached a little bit from what was actually going on in the Mass, and there was a growing sense that something had to be done. For priests, liturgy became was more and more a matter of rubrics. It was always it was always prayer, of course, at least for, for faithful priests it was. There were so many rules. There were countless rules about everything from how wide you could hold your hands out. If you put your hands out wider than your shoulders, it was a mortal sin. You know, that was kind of... It was very, you know, there were just rules about everything. When you went up the steps, you had to put your right foot on the step first. Every tiny detail. Right. So it had got out of hand. It had got silly, really, in a sense. All of that done with good reasons and good motivation, but it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, in the 19th century, there were various things happening. Um, there were People were doing a lot of research, uh, historical research, into the Church Fathers, some of the really great writers of the early Church. And that provoked some renewed interest in the liturgy because some of these very early documents that we have from, from the, the early life of the church talk about what early Christians did. And people are saying, well, hang on, can we not learn something from, from this? So people are beginning to, to show an interest in that. And in France in the 830s, there was a Benedictine abbey founded under a, a priest called Prosper Geranger. And one of their key aims was to to look at restoring the liturgy, freeing it from an over complex ritual, reforming it, and returning to term the noble simplicity of the Roman rite. They started to do things like restore Gregorian chant in the liturgy, which might not seem to us very radical it It kind of led to you know some of the thought that came out of that and the movement that came out from that led to a document that Pope Pius X issued in nineteen o three in which he basically promoted Gregorian chant and outlawed some of these more operatic mass settings. So that might seem to us quite a small thing, but it makes a big difference because some of the, in the worst excesses of the music at that time, people would have like a Gloria that would go on for 15, 20 minutes or something. And basically the priest would just get on with the mass while the Gloria was going on. So, I mean, it seems bizarre to us, but it was like, you know, the music became everything and the mass was just going on in the background. You know, so the Pope said, no, that's not what it's about. So, so he basically banned it and ordered a, a simplifying of the music in the church. So that's 1903. So already you can see there's renewal, there's change. People are beginning to try and bring things, uh, change things around. And he made other reforms as well, Pius X. He called for more frequent reception of Holy Communion. He lowered the age of the first Holy Communion from 12 to 7. That was in 1910. And he also considered reforming the, the breviary, the liturgy of the hours that priests and, and religious use, well, priests particularly, uh, for the breviary. Um, he called a conference in 1909, um, which was, I think, the first time that people talked about some of the texts being translated into local languages rather than Latin. Um, so all these things kind of predate the council, I suppose, is the point I'm making, that, that all these things were being thought about for quite a few decades before the council took place. There was a lot of other scholarship, there was a lot of other historical inquiry took place, especially in France and in Germany. And then Pius XII did quite a bit as well. So he's around in the 1940s and 1950s really. And he issued three important documents. Mr. Corpus Christi on the nature of the church. Divino Aflanti Spiritu, which was on the study of sacred scripture, on the nature of sacred scripture, which was very important as well for Catholics to take that more seriously and to rediscover the treasures of that. It's another important thing that informed the Second Vatican Council. And Mediato Dei, which was on liturgical reform. And that encouraged people to participate, particularly in, in uh, chants and so on, and in gestures, but also warned against false innovations, I think we called it, um, with people kind of adapting, changing things too much. So it's kind of balancing, saying, we need some change, let's, be, let's consider it, and so on. Let's take it carefully. He also allowed evening masses for the first time, which was a, as a result of the war, because it wasn't always possible for people to gather in the morning. He reduced the Holy communion fast from three uh, to three hours, because it had been always from midnight, as some of you will know before that. But if you allow evening masses, that's not very practical. So he said three hours is enough. And then later, he changed that to one hour, which of course is what we still have today. He cautiously favoured the use of the vernacular, increased the number of non-Latin services, especially in the mission territories, interestingly. So one of the things the Pope was doing was saying, in those countries where we are trying to bring the word of God to them, there's no point burdening them with trying to get them to learn Latin as well. So let's uh, you know, make allowances and so on. So there were changes afoot there. Reforms of Holy Week, the introduction of the Easter Vigil for the first time in 1951, new rite of Holy Week in 1955 and so on. 
So there was an awful lot uh, going on before that. In 1948, I'm sorry to kind of bombard you with dates and so on, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of, of some of the things that were going on. He set up a commission for the reform of the liturgy under Monsignor Bunini, who actually went on to serve as the head of that commission until 1970. So this is the man who actually oversaw the implementation of the reforms of the council. He was there from 1948 to 1970, the same priest in charge of this this commission. So as I say, the point is essentially that an awful lot of work had been done, an awful lot of thought had been given, an awful lot of, of movement and momentum really had been built up before the council to say things need to change in the liturgy um, and you know that had begun to happen. Alongside all of those things there was a renewed understanding of the church which would bear fruit in Lumen Gentium in the council, the document on the church. There were renewed challenges for the church as well, post-war, and lots of secular changes, of course, by the time of the council, things beginning to, to change very quickly, and people's understanding of, of how they, they were to live, and so on. And also, the church was now far more international. Um, you know, the church was had a presence in many other countries where it had not been a century or two earlier. And technical changes, things like the introduction of microphones, things like the fact that you could now broadcast, so you can now say, well, do we put the mass on television or do we not? Those things become questions which just hadn't been there before. You know, if you've got a microphone, it does make a difference to how you, you go about celebrating mass in a big church. because All these things were changed, had, had led up to the, to the council. Okay, Just to return now to the, to the document itself and what it, it says, the second part of that first chapter um, looks at the promotion of liturgical instruction and active participation. And I think it's very important that it links these two things. One of the big things that the Council wants to do is to encourage us to participate in the liturgy. But it links it, at this point, right at the beginning, with liturgical instruction. So in other words, if you are to participate, a key part of that is actually you have to know what it's all about. You know, It's not just about doing things, it's about an internal participation as well, which involves some understanding of, of what actually is going on. So here's what it says, paragraph 14. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. This public work demands that people actually participate in it. To which the Christian people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, that's a quote from uh, First Letter of St. Peter, uh, to which the Christian people have a right and obligation by reason of their baptism. So we have a right to participate in the liturgy. We also have an obligation to participate in the liturgy because of our baptism, um, because our baptism makes us a chosen race, a, royal, a holy nation, so it makes us members of that. So we have a right and duty to participate. The public nature of the liturgy demands it. And also, I th there's another important point here, which is which would go on to be spelt out fully in the document on the church a little later, where it says Lumen Gentium, the document on the church, talks about the church being the people of God, and the, the image is of really of like the people of God in the Old Testament traveling together, so that we're not just all individuals who happen to come together on a Sunday to do something, but actually there's a collective nature. We're not just personally on the way to salvation, also as a people we are journeying towards Christ as well. And so if that's the case, if there's a collective element to our relationship with God, we're not just in, it's not just me and Jesus, although that's very important. It's also us and the Lord. It's us and our Father, not just my Father. So if that's the case, then it's important that we do, we collectively gather together to meet God in the liturgy, and not just as individuals in our own private prayers and so on. It, it talks about the need for, so it kind of goes on to spell out some of what this might mean in terms of the practicalities. It talks about requisite pedagogy, which is kind of church speak for saying people need to be taught about it really. And therefore there must be better training of seminarians. So it says, for example, things like you've got to have lit liturgy professors and you've got to, it's got to be taught, there have got to be courses, it must be on the syllabus. Um, these are kind of reforms really, these are things that now, it's not just something where you learn the rules of this is how you say Mass, you make sure you use your right foot first and you don't put your hands out here. Um, it's actually about, priests must understand what this is about as well, so that they can communicate it to other people. It's not just for the few to understand, it's for everybody to understand. 
with zeal and patience, pastors of souls, priests, must promote the liturgical instruction of the faithful and also their active participation, both internal and external. So participation is, on the one hand, about what we outwardly do, which might be using our voices or our bodies to, to praise the Lord um, and to participate in the liturgy, but also it's internal as well. So we can actively participate in moments of silence, you know, because it's about being attentive to the Lord in prayer, being aware of his presence, uh, and being aware of what, it, what he's giving us at that time. And the document does say, as well, that the transmission of rites by radio and television may be permitted, but must be done with delicacy and dignity, and a representative of the bishop must oversee it. So you can see they're beginning to say, we can open this out actually now. It's about the church not so much being inward-looking, but about offering these things out to the world as well, which I think also is probably quite uh, quite an important step. Uh, moving, moving on the document itself, it, it then goes on to talk about what um, reforms of, of the church. And the beginning, it kind of, it starts not so much by saying these are the reforms, but lays out the principles on which the reform will be based. So um, uh, just an important little quotation, I think. Holy Mother Church desires to undertake with, a great, with great care, it's important, the restoration of the liturgy itself. For the liturgy is made up of unchangeable elements, divinely instituted, things which God has given us, which we can't change, and of elements subject to change. These latter not only may be changed, but ought to be changed with the passage of time if they have suffered from the intrusion of anything out of harmony with the inner nature of the liturgy or have become less suitable. So in other words, of the things that we can change, um, actually it's to be expected and it is a good thing that they do change sometimes because we actually need that to adapt to, to time and place and so on. So as I say, in some ways I would see the liturgy as being a bit like a kind of organic thing that in some ways it has its DNA which is given by God, and you can't change that, and you mustn't attempt to change that. It is what it is, um, but as it grows and develops, from time to time it might it might need cutting back a little bit to allow more growth and to allow it to, to do what it's supposed to do. It talks about how the regulation of the liturgy depends solely on the authority of the church, that is, on the apostolic seats. So in other words, Rome has control over it, basically, but may delegate some things to bishops or to bishops' conferences. And I think there's an important little line here where it says, therefore no person, not even a priest, may add, remove, or change anything in the liturgy on his own authority. It's not a private thing. The liturgy is not the property of priests. You wouldn't always know that, I think, to be honest. Um, you, you know, sometimes going to Mass or seeing the way some priests go about things. But actually, it doesn't belong to, to the priest. It belongs to God, ultimately. It's the work of Christ, and it's not for individuals to be changing um, or attempting to change. Let's let's move on to the the next chapter. The second chapter of the document is on is on the most sacred mystery of the Eucharist. So these are the reforms to the Mass, um, which are the things that most people will think of when they think of Vatican II. To be honest, isn't it really above anything else? The Church therefore earnestly desires that Christ faithful, when present at this mystery of faith, the Mass, should not be there as strangers or silent spectators. On a contrary, on, on the contrary, through a good understanding of the rites and prayers, notice through a good understanding, they should take part in the sacred action, conscious of what they are doing, with devotion and full collaboration. It goes on to say, offering the Immaculate Victim Christ, not only through the hands of the priest, but also together with him, they should learn to offer themselves. When, we, when the priest says, my sacrifice, my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father, the point is, all of us are making a sacrifice, you know, the point is we're making a sacrifice at the altar. An altar is a place of sacrifice, that's what, that's what it is. Um, and that's why we use the word altar, but Protestants who don't like to think of the Mass as, you know, Eucharist as a sacrifice don't use it. They talk about communion tables. But it's a place of sacrifice. The priest in particular offering the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and renewing that, but all of us there to make the sacrifice of our lives to the Lord. And in that sense, that's part of what it means by that full and conscious and active participation is that we're actually bringing our lives to the Mass as well. It's not just about um, what we're doing and so on, but it's about letting our whole lives be drawn into that, that summit, of, of uh, the source and summit of the Church's life. So about halfway through the document, you get to the bit that everybody's interested in, which is what it's actually going to do. Um, so these are the, I think there are nine things it says, so I will kind of go through them because it's important just to recognize what the document actually did say was, should happen. 
Firstly, that the rights should be simplified so that their unity and their connection is more evident, so particularly the connection between the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, the first part of the Mass with the readings and obviously the Eucharist itself. That was the first one, so simplification. Secondly, that the treasures of the Bible are to be opened up to the faithful. Um, and basically it talks there about reforming the lectionary. So now we actually have quite a wide range of readings read, and on a Sunday, our, the Gospel's on a three-year cycle, so that over three years, you actually hear almost, you don't quite hear it all, but you hear almost all of the four Gospels read over those three years. So it's an attempt to make sure that we're familiar with these things. And I think we are, actually, much more, much more so than we would have been otherwise. The homily is to be reformed, and is to be esteemed as part of the liturgy itself, and it shouldn't be omitted, particularly on a Sunday or a feast day. You know, in, in, you occasionally get priests that will make the sign of the cross at the beginning and the end of the homilies. Have you seen that? It originates in the, the old liturgy. It was something that always happened before the, before the changes. And the reason why the sign of the cross was made at the beginning and the end of the homily was because the homily was not part of the Mass. So, because all of the Mass was in Latin, when you get to the bit that isn't in Latin, the priest would make the sign of the cross, say, right, we're, we're stepping outside of the Mass for a minute, now I'm going to give you a homily, and then we'll step back into the Mass and carry on. It, there's, a, there's a bit of, I think there's a debate at the moment about what you can use that slot for, because there are, there are certainly some people who, again, before, I think before the reforms of the Council, priests often would have a, there'd be a kind of schema for preaching, so there'd be certain subjects, almost like a syllabus, really, and this week you will be talking about the church's teaching on marriage, and this week you'll be talking about um, whatever. Um, and, and of course, all that was done away with because we were to concentrate on the liturgical text and on the readings. There, there's certainly a school of thought now which says, if you do that, one of the problems is that you tend to repeat the same things, and there are some aspects of the church's life which almost never get a mention, or they might get mentioned on a particular feast day, which you know occurs on a Wednesday at 9 o'clock Mass when there's nobody there. There is a discussion, there is a debate about that. But the Council really is saying it should be based on the, the, the readings and the liturgical texts. Um, so, but, but, so that's those, those first three reforms. The fourth one is that the prayer of the faithful, the bidding prayers, is to be restored. So that was the, the next thing. It always survived, I think, on Good Friday. There had always been those prayers in the Good Friday liturgy, but in Mass generally they weren't there. They were restored uh, by the Second Vatican Council. By far probably the most famous of the reforms, the fifth one, I'm going to read out to you what it says. This is the question, the, the thorny issue of language. A suitable place may be allotted to the vernacular in, ma in masses which are celebrated with the people, interestingly enough. So if it's, a, if it's a private mass, you're not supposed to. Especially in the readings and the common prayer. So the council is particularly saying the scripture readings and the bidding prayers may be in the local language. Um, that's, those are the two things that singles out. And also, as local, uh, local conditions may warrant in those parts which pertain to the people. So in other words, the bits that the people actually say. Nevertheless, care must be taken to ensure that the faithful may also be able to say or sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the Mass which pertain to them. So it's certainly allowing for the use of local languages, but it is also saying that people ought to be able to recite the Gloria in Latin, Sanctus, the Annus Dei, those sorts of things, um, to give them their Latin rhythms. The Holy Communion should be re received from the same Mass at which it's consecrated. This is one of the things that the Council said, which, which is like widely ignored, to be honest. Um, you know, where every Mass the priest goes up to the tabernacle, and you know, uh, I do quite a lot of supply work, and it happens in almost every parish I go to. A Eucharistic minister goes up to the tabernacle, and actually, it says no. The best, the, the proper practice doesn't forbid anything else, but it says the usual practice best practice is that the, the, you consecrate the host that you need for that Mass and people receive that from that Mass that you don't always go to the tabernacle. Um, and it may be received under both kinds in certain limited conditions as well. So that's another reform that it brought in. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the two halves of the Mass, if you like, the two big parts of the Mass, are closely connected and priests must instruct the faithful to take part in the entire Mass. I kind of puzzled over what that meant, really, but I suppose it's saying that, you know, you shouldn't really just turn up for the elevation of the host, which is kind of a devotional thing that people maybe did in the past. Really, the whole thing is one, it's, it's one unit, unity, really, and it should, be, um, it, it should be treated as such. You come for the whole thing, not just for part of it. And also, it allowed 
Conceleration, which is something that happened in the East particularly, but not really in the West. Permission for that was required. And a new rite for Conceleration. This is when you've got a number of priests together celebrating Mass. Um, a new rite should be drawn up and should be included in the Missal. So those are the nine reforms that it made. Most of those things I think people are aware of, although some people think it probably said more than it did. Some people also said it, think it says some things that it actually never said at all. And some people don't uh, implement some of the things that it did say. So there's a kind of whole mix, really, isn't there, of you know, things that have been taken on board and things which, which haven't. The third chapter um, looks at the other sacraments. And I'll just pick out a couple of things that it, it said. Again, it allows for the wider use of the vernacular in different sacraments. The restoration of the RCIA is quite interesting. So it's kind of, again, going back to the early life of the church, there were particular stages that people would go through before they were received as, as converts into the church. And the, and the church kind of recommended, the council recommended a restoration of this, which is implemented to an extent, I think. I'm not sure it quite has been properly implemented. But there'd be new rites of baptism for adults and for children, and the one for children would put more emphasis on the role of parents and godparents. A revision of the rite of penance, so confession, and also the rite of anointing, which would reduce and simplify uh, the anointing so that you weren't there used to be quite a lot of different anointings in different parts of the body. That was all reduced. And also it allowed for the fact that people may be anointed as soon as they begin to be in danger of death, is the phrase that's used. So that previously it was just almost, you, you're kind of waiting for somebody to almost take their last breath and send for the priest. And there are people who still do it. Trust me, I was a hospital chaplain until very recently. And uh, you, you'd kind of want to shake them and say, why did you leave it till the last minute? The rite of confirmation was changed, um, or it was to be changed, to include the renewal of baptismal promises, which we kind of take for granted now. The rite of marriage would be looked at. The ordination rite would be looked at as well. In the rite of marriage, the prayer for the bride was to be amended to demonstrate equality between the spouses. There was to be a revision of some of the other rites of the church, rites for religious profession and so on, funeral rites, more show, show more clearly the path of Christian death. So in other words, show more clearly that it's to do with Easter, really, to do with the death and resurrection of, of Christ. The divine office, the liturgy of the hours, which, you know, so morning and evening prayer of the, of the church, were to be were to be said at the correct times of day, it said. So priests who say the whole thing, like, first thing in the morning, you know, and get it all out of the way, that's not allowed. <laughs> it, they were to be revised and simplified. Other changes to be made. It does say as well that it, the laity should be encouraged to use this and the principal hours, especially Vespers, evening prayer, should be said in churches on Sundays and on major feasts. How many parishes do you know that have implemented that? Not many. So important that, that that's to be a part of the prayer of the whole church, not just the prayer of priests and just uh, and the vernacular may be used again in certain limited circumstances. The liturgical year was to be changed as well to to be simplified. Sunday was to be kept as the most important day, and other things were not to get in the way of it unless they were of the greatest importance. Lent was to show more clearly the link with baptism and penance, as in, yeah, well, penitential practices, but confession as well, particularly. So on, music is the subject of chapter 6, which looks at various things. But just share one interesting phrase from it, where it says, The musical tradition of the church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater than that of any other art. So I think it's very interesting. You think of all the the wonderful art that the church has inspired, but it says music is the most important thing because other things are kind of additions to the liturgy, but if you take a text of the scripture and you set it to music, that's actually part of the liturgy. So you have a wonderful church building, that's not actually part of the liturgy, it's a setting for it. Or you have a beautiful statue, like Pieta or something like that, or a wonderful painting, those things might adorn the liturgy and embellish it, but they're not actually part of it, whereas the music is. So that's why it's held in greater esteem and music should be taught in seminaries and in other institutions. The last chapter does talk about sacred art and sacred furnishings. It talks about the responsibility of bishops to promote art and to be discerning in art. So in other words, don't be putting anything in your churches that's not suitable for it, fathers. And yeah, various other points. So those are, are kind of some of the things. That, broadly speaking, those are the recommendations that the uh, document made. Does anybody want to say anything more about that? Because I'm going to just very briefly talk about the other document, which is kind of get pegged on the end. Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on the liturgy, places a lot of emphasis on the role that priests have in renewing the liturgy um, and so on, and particularly in educating the faithful to, so that the liturgy might be renewed. And it's um, that's shown in various ways. Uh, but also that emphasis is shared by this the second document, Presbyteral Ordinus, which looks at the ministry and life of priests. And it says 
A most important and increasingly difficult role is being assigned to priests in the renewal of Christ's church. And that's the reason they write the document, they say, is because the priests have this very difficult, increasingly difficult role of helping to renew the church. I think there's another part of the, the context of it as well, which is that the first Vatican Council back in 1869, 1870, was looking at the nature of the church and it looked an awful lot at the Pope and the papal infallibility, but it kind of got cut short really and didn't do some of the things that it wanted to do, like to speak about bishops and how bishops might relate to the Pope and so on. And so Vatican II did that and picked up the baton. And I think by extension, it talks a bit about, therefore, about priests and how priests really share the work of bishops in the life of the church. Um, and that's where it takes its starting point, really, that priests share in the bishop's ministry to a subordinate degree. So I like to think of myself as a subordinate bishop. Oh, I'm joking. Um, but, uh, but there were to be co-workers with the bishop, and the ministry of priests is directed to the Eucharist and finds its consummation in it. In other words, source, that's also at the heart of the priest's life, as well as the life of the whole church. It, it says a lot of in, interesting things, really, and I don't have time to go into it any, le any length, but it talks about the desire it has for priests to live with the rest of men and women, obviously, as brothers. Even though they're taken from among them, they don't, they're not set apart. So there is a sense of being set apart and removed, but they're not kind of aloof. So it says that the priests will be powerless to serve men and women, if they remained aloof from their life and circumstances. So priests are not to be distant, even though, in a sense, they are set apart for a particular way of life and particular tasks. They are still to be amongst the people. That they help to form the people of God through the preaching of the word. And that preaching should be concrete. The, the priest must expound the word of God, not merely in a general and abstract way, but by application but by application of the eternal truth of the gospel to the concrete circumstances of life. So you've got to make that bridge you know, and that's, that's a renewal of preaching, really, that he's trying to, to bring about. The talks about the centrality of the Eucharist, kind of talked about that already. They must show kindness to people while also upholding the demands of doctrine. It's that thing that I think every priest knows the experience of having to, you know, to uphold the teaching of the church while also showing people kindness. And sometimes the things that you have to say to people are not things that they want to hear. Uh, you know, and often that's not because you seek those things, but they come and ask you a question, can I do this? And you say, well, actually, you know, but you know, how do you do that with kindness? How do you um, put those things across in a way that um, is compassionate and gentle while still holding to what the church teaches and what the Lord has revealed to us? It talks about bringing people to Christian maturity, that external beauty of our ceremonies is useless if people are not nurturing Christian maturity, a real relationship with Christ, a real desire to know and love the Lord. It talks about how the priests have a special duty of care to the poor and weaker ones, to young people, to married couples and to parents, the duty to build up the community, always centred on the Eucharist, it keeps coming back to that, and how priests shouldn't be servants of a human ideology. There are some nice passages actually where it talks about the union and cooperation of priests and bishops, about the shared mission of priests, about how older and younger priests should accept and respect each other as well, which I think is it's, um, very nice really. About Again, it talks about shared time together, hospitality for each other as priests, um, and care for priests in need, you know, priests who are in difficulty for whatever reason, through illness, through circumstances, that we ought to care for them. Other priests should care for them as well. It talks about how priests should be willing to listen to lay people, to recognize their experience and competence in different fields of human activity, and says, in this way, they will be able to recognize, along with them, the signs of the times, and about fostering unity in the Christian community as well, that they must be defenders of the common good for which they are responsible in the bishop's name, and at the same time, unwavering champions of truth, lest the faithful should be carried about with every wind of doctrine. So we are like to be anchors to make sure you don't get carried off by every wind of doctrine. Uh, that's a quotation from St. Paul, actually. It, it also talks about, and this is, this is the bit you really need to listen to, the laity have obligations to their priests uh, to treat them as fathers and pastors and to help them as so far as possible. Also, it talks about how the priest's mission is universal. So it's an important thing, this, because we all kind of get wrapped up in our own patch, that this is my parish and I'll look after it as best I can. But actually, it says the priest's mission is universal. You have responsibility to people who are not of your patch. So priests you know, should be willing to go and work outside of their own area. Dioceses should be willing to share their priests with other dioceses that are in need. It talks about some of the qualities a priest might need, how his own personal holiness actually contributes to his ministry, about asceticism which is needed to lead the communities. They shouldn't be leading an extravagant lifestyle. 
about humility and obedience, about faithfulness to Christ and his church. It does talk about the reasons for and the importance. It talks about how priests should make a daily examination of conscience and regular confession, about how learning and study are also important in the life of a priest as well. It talks about other things which are a bit easier for us, about how we must be remunerated, about we have the right to a holiday each year, and also it talks about essentially kind of social security for priests really, that sense of that, that there should be some kind of safety net to make sure that we're all provided for. And it ends, what well, I thought actually was quite a touching thing when I read it, for all this the Sacred Council affectionately offers its thanks to all the priests of the world. Just very briefly, just to kind of finish off what I, what I wanted to say today, when the council took place, it was for the first time in the church's life we, we were in the age of mass media when something like this happened. And at every previous council what had happened was that people, you know, bishops would attend the council, whatever decisions were made, w were made, bishops would take them back to the diocese and they would begin to implement them. What happened with the Vatican Council was, everything got reported on the television, on the radio, and the newspapers, and it was all being implemented, in some cases, before bishops even got back from Rome. So there was a difference, really, and, it, and in some ways it was perhaps too hasty, that the council called for a revision, it called for various things. Certainly my own reading of the situation is that, that probably caused quite a lot of unnecessary pain and angst, really, in some ways. But anyway, we live and learn, don't we? But um, So that was an important difference. The reforms, in some ways, outpaced the understanding of what the Council was really trying to say. I've already mentioned that I think some aspects were very well implemented, some things haven't been implemented, some things have been implemented with a bit extra added on as well. But at the heart of it all is that message that the liturgy, the Mass, is the source and summit of everything that we do. It's about that full and conscious and active participation both interior and exterior. And it's borne out, that participation is borne out not only by what we do in the Mass itself, but by how we live as faithful followers of Christ at other times in our lives as well. So that that prayer, that meeting with the Lord in that public work of the liturgy is extended in our daily lives, in our constant prayer, in our charity, in our service of one another. If it doesn't do that, then something is going wrong. And although the Lord is certainly present in the liturgy, Perhaps, you know, if we're not somehow taking that presence out, it might be because we're not somehow approaching him in the right way and, and being open to meeting him. So that's a bit of food for thought. Really. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. You've heard more than enough of me. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this talk and want to hear the rest of the series, they will be available at www.metanoiaproject.co.uk